doing, sir? How you doing, ma'am? Just want to talk to you for a minute. Can I do that? Uh, we're going to continue what we were talking about um, last week. Um, like I said, this will probably be a series. I'm not sure. We'll just see. But um, I don't plan on being before you too long. Now, uh, Coach probably can um, vouch for this. I saw something recently about Kobe Bryant. He was very, very enraged with his teammates. This was like the latter part playing with the Lakers when Shaq left and they had to rebuild and all this stuff. And so uh, when they, they were getting blown out by a team, I forgot which team it was. So when halftime came, Kobe was in, you know, I don't condone you cursing or anything, but <laughs> he was going off on his teammates and he said, you know what? Kobe had some signature shoes out and he let all his teammates wear his shoes. He's like, you know what? All y'all take my shoes off. <laughs> he made all of his teammates take their shoes off and he threw them in the trash can. He was like, y'all ain't even worthy to wear my shoes. Y'all too soft. That's that mama mentality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what that got to do with the word? <laughs> well, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 says this. So I, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, a mature behavior, a life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. That's the Amplified Ephesians chapter one, chapter four, verse one. In other words, God has called us to do something, and we need to work worth, walk worthy of that calling. So, what was Kobe Bryant saying? Y'all got to have character. If you're gonna wear my shoes. <laughs> Come on now, you, you can't be soft. You got to have the character of a winner. Mm -hmm. right. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, mm -hmm. come on now. Yeah. If you're going to say that you a faith person, mm -hmm. if you're going to say I'm a person that follows after mm -hmm. headquarters, my ambassador, that, that I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ, hey, if I'm not going to walk like it, I need to take off the shoes. Take off the shoes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you talk about sports, any championship team, NBA, NFL, they have to have what you call a dog on the team. In other words, somebody that don't have any common sense. <laughs> Chicago Bulls, back in the day, they had Dennis Rodman. Every championship team has to have somebody that don't care. <laughs> See, you said that earlier. I, I don't care anymore. You have to have an attitude. I'm not talking about an attitude of being conceited or thinking you're better than anybody else. But there has to be something on the inside of you that says, I don't care. I'm following the instructions that headquarters sent and come hell or high water, that's what I'm going to do. Regardless if I get fired for it or I'm praised for it. But I'm going to walk in the calling that God has for me. Kobe said, take my shoes off. And God, through Paul, is saying, hey, walk worthy of the call. And so with that being said, we're talking about the gifts of the spirit. But you know, in Genesis 1 26, we're not going to go back over that anymore, but that was a vision statement that God gave us. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And he says, Hey, go have dominion over the fowl of the air and everything that creeps among the earth. Notice he didn't say dominion over other people. <laughs> so this is the assignment that he's called us to. So in the beginning, there was no religion. 
There were no worship services. The original intent was for man to have dominion. So when we got, I understand why we have churches today. I mean, this is one. <laughs> you know, he's called a five-fold ministry gifts for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry. That don't mean do the work of the ministry here. That means do the work of the ministry out there. And so the bottom line is God has called us to have dominion. And the late Miles Monroe said this, and I so agree with it. The worst place for you to try to have influence is in a church meeting. That's the worst place. That's where politics comes in. That's where people trying to be the head person and, and scratching and clawing to be close to the pastor and all this foolishness. When God has called us to be the church, the church, me, you, all y'all has left the building. God didn't intend for us to have all this political infighting here. For what? We supposed to be out there. And so, Lord, I ain't mean to get here. I'm gonna just flow. So you have a lot of institutions built up and now it's a place where you have money funneled through. Now we gotta keep this thing going regardless if God is in it or not. God might tell you to shut it down and move. The love of money yeah, yeah. is the root of all sorts of evil. So now you have manipulation. Now you have all sorts of things to keep something going when God says shut it down. Kingdom mindset is we go out. All of us are gifts and so when you are so busy going out you don't have to have a bunch of nonsense when you come in because you're sure of your call you're sure of your vocation and me as the pastor shouldn't be talking down to nobody because everybody got something to contribute. You got something I don't have. You have expertise I don't have. So who am I to act like I'm a king over when God's called me to serve? Lord, let me get out of there. That I, I wasn't even planning on doing that. So let me just keep on going here. So here in uh, <laughs> here in Luke, uh, Jesus tells us his personal mission statement. And so a lot of times, and don't get me wrong, I'm not being sacrilegious. Of course, we need to accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Of course. But that's not where it stops. And that's where a lot of people stop right there. And so we spend the rest of our lives living in nonsense, being ineffective for the mission statement that he's called us to. And so right here in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is on me or upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now in the Greek, the original concept of this when God, when, when Jesus is saying he has uh, sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, the actual concept of that is this. Jesus was declaring to the bound that the door is already open. In the original language, you won't see that in the English, but the original language, the concept of that is that, listen, 
I'm proclaiming to the bound that the door is already open for you to walk through. You remember the story I told you about the elephant rope? Had that little rope on a baby elephant and it, it was growing up and it got a little tug. So after a while, it knew not to go any further. But then it became a big elephant. Had the same little rope on it. And it refused to go past a certain point because it was trained to yield to the concept that the rope has power that it no longer has. Because how many of you know an elephant is very strong? All it got to do is just... But the mind stopped it. And so that is what Jesus is saying. Somebody say, the door is already open. You're already free. And so that's what Jesus is doing part of his mission statement and he proclaims and he he charges us to do the same to tell everybody the door is already open mm -hmm. freedom is already yours mm -hmm. if you can get past the battlefield of the mind yeah 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. you can do it and in order to do this we need to understand that we need assistance to do it. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to read verses 31 through 33. Once again, it's Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 33. And it says this. Once again, Matthew 13, 31 through 33 he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, somebody say when it grows. When it grows, when it, grows it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. These parables are all about influence. That's it. You have the smallest seed with the physical sight. But when you talk about vision, it's actually a tree. But that little small seed grows by water. The Holy Spirit gives the increase. And that we're not just here to give our hearts to the Lord, but it's about influencing the kingdom for his glory. Amen. And so we have... A few verses here, and I'm just going to read 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, because we read that last year, last year, Lord, <laughs> last week. <laughs> but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Amen. So if somebody's using a gift to kind of profit off of it and make a name for themselves, that's heresy. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's for. And so we need to understand that it's for the profit of what? Of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. Yeah. Somebody say same, same spirit. spirit. That's really important there. Yeah. <laughs> to another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another different kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but one and the same spirit works all these things <laughs> distributing to each one individually as he wills now it's important to understand that because we're going to deal with the first two today more in depth than we did last week. Because how many of you like, know, like we said before, we need this. Yeah. We got to have it. Uh -huh. yeah. I can't just say I'm saved and then just tiptoe through the tulips. There's too much going on in the world today to be without this. And so here we are 
write down 1 Corinthians 14, 39. And that says, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. And once again, that's 1 Corinthians 14, 39. We also have 1 Corinthians 14, 1. It talks about desiring spiritual gifts. And we have 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. It talks about not quenching the spirit. And sometimes when uh, the, the gifts of the spirit in operation for our lives personally to do something, we can be disobedient by quenching the spirit. And so it talks about not doing that. And we also have 1 Timothy 4.14 talk about don't neglect the gift that God has given you. And 2 Timothy 1.6, it reminds us, Paul is reminding Timothy to stir up. You got to stir it up. You can't just say, oh, that, okay, gifts. No, you got to stir it up because he wants all of us to be able to operate in one or multiple of these gifts because we have to have it. We need it. Amen. And so we're going to deal with the word of knowledge real quick here. The gift of the word of knowledge refers to the ability to know facts about a situation or a spiritual principle that could not have been known by natural means. That is the word of knowledge. God wants us to operate in the word of knowledge. We have to have that because we cannot live by our finite minds. We're going to miss it. So that's the word of knowledge. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. In John 4, 16 through 18, we see that Jesus is walking in a word of knowledge. And many of you are familiar with this. Once again, John 4, 16 through 18, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying that. <laughs> I have no husband for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. That is a word of knowledge. Telling you something that's in the present. What's going on that's over your finite mind. And so Jesus is the best example of all with that. And so here's another one here. Matthew 16, 17. And Jesus answered him. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because he asked, who do men say that I am? Mm -hmm. Simon Bar-Jonah said, Thou art the Christ, mm -hmm. the Son of the living God. He said, Hey, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. That was a word of knowledge. He was flowing in the gift of the Spirit. He was stirring it up. And, and so that was not mental assent for him to say that. That came, that was downloaded to him yeah. from headquarters. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so we move on uh, quickly here. That was the word of knowledge. And we have the word of wisdom. Many times, these both of these operate, they intermingle with each other many times. Not all of the time, but many times. And so I'm going to give you an example, a biblical example of this manifestation of the word of wisdom is seen in Noah. God told him. It's going to rain. They didn't even know what rain was because dew came out of the ground. That's how it always happened. But say something new is coming. That's right. That's right. And so he tells us things in the future that we would not know with our finite natural minds. And so he's telling Noah all these years, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. And he was literally... <laughs> chastised and picked on and joked on and all of these things because it's never rained before. But how many of you know when that uh, door closed and <laughs> that rain started dropping, I can just imagine people, let me in, let me in, please, please. I'm sorry, Noah, but it's too late. Word of wisdom. And 
even with Noah, it was synonymous because even though he knew what was going on in the future, God gave him a word of knowledge to be able to, hey, I, I need you to use gopher wood. I want you to do it this much for the measurement. And that, that was word of knowledge and word of wisdom working hand in hand. And Coach mentioned he had the hook, hiccups. You know, God showed him something. The night before. Mm -hmm. And he quenched it. Mm -hmm. And then God brought it back to his remembrance the next day and had mercy. Mm -hmm. And he followed instructions and it was gone. Yeah. So that's an example of word of knowledge. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. To God be the glory. <laughs> and we need this. I'm telling you, we need it. I mean, there's some times where you may be on your job or your career or your business and something comes up and and there's no book knowledge right. that will help you to a solution. Mm -hmm. And you just hum that up, oh, shock, mm -hmm. up, oh, under your breath and just stir up those gifts. And the next thing you know, something is downloaded to you from heaven. And people are asking, how did you know that? How did you do that? Oh, here we go. Influence. Because you are walking in excellence. Because you were able to do something that was supernatural, now people are going to want to know, how did you do it? There goes the good news. There goes the yeast. There goes the mustard seed growing because the Holy Spirit is giving the increase. Amen? Amen. And so with this word of uh, wisdom, there are three main purposes for it. The first one, to help believers witness to something God is doing or about to do. That's number one. Let me say that again. Word of wisdom is commonly used for these three purposes. Number one, to help believers witness to something God is doing or is about to do. Number two, to prepare for something that's going to happen in the future. Like he's already done. Hey, the world is going to get worse. But the church, yeah. oh, it's going to be more glorious than ever before. But we have to listen. We have to yield. We have to humble ourselves to the gifts of the Spirit. But remember last week we said this. Our foundation have to be what? The fruit of the Spirit. Character, integrity, consistency. But we need the gifts of the Spirit. The third thing here, to seek to change a future event through prayer and or fasting. Sometimes we get in a certain spot and we are warned of something coming up and we are able to pray and fast, turn the plate down and say, Father, I see my grandson or my son or my coworker going down a dangerous path. Let me turn the plate down and pray in tongues over this thing because God has shown me a vision of a bleak future and God will use you to pray a turnaround and all of a sudden that person somebody else will come in their life to tell them something that they need to hear and all of a sudden supernaturally crisis averted it doesn't always happen like that I had a dream about a year ago I won't go into it but it was very devastating and the worst part about the dream, mama, God told me there wasn't nothing I could do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I had to just sit and watch stuff happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, your first inclination is, like, I'm going to pray, but it's like, mm -hmm. and it hurt. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But God was warning of some things so I would be prepared. And God does that for all of us. Amen. Oh, man, just got a good business deal. Oh, this thing is nice. All of a sudden, an alarm on your insides. 
Don't do it. Don't do it. And so it's very important to understand that we flow with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. With my power.